So if you're joining us uh, for the first time in the last few weeks, uh, we're talking about home improvement, uh, not the TV show, uh, but we are talking about the family. We're talking about those areas of the family that we tend to find struggle in. And today, uh, it is Mother's Day, and I'm not very accustomed to doing it any other way, so this is probably not abnormal to you. Uh, but we're not necessarily going to talk about moms today. However, you may be convicted as a mom today. So I will leave that in your hands today. Today we're going to talk about a subject that probably all moms and all husbands and all children and anybody in between deals with, and that is the subject of anger. And how do we control that anger? Uh, for those of you who have no anger problems whatsoever, this would be a good time for you to jump up and leave because this is not going to matter to you whatsoever. But for all the rest of us who are truthful and honest, you'll just stay right where you are and we're going to work through this anger issue together today. I came across a statistic over the last few weeks that I thought was kind of amazing when it came to this issue of anger. I thought it would be higher than what it was, and so maybe that says something about me, too. So here's some, some, just some statistics to kind of throw out to you this morning as we get started. The statistic tells us that the average man loses his temper about six times a week. I know, right? That seems just a little low to me. Now, do you want to take a guess on how many times a week that a woman loses her temper? Women lose their temper 30 times. No, it's three times a week. <laughs> I'm convicted too, okay? So I wasn't going to just throw that out there. The interesting thing about men and women both, however, is that we both get angry. Women tend to get angry more at people because women are relational, where men tend to get mad at things. We get mad at things that don't work right or things that we can't fix, those kinds of things, you know, really important stuff, right? So, so that's just kind of the way we're made up. But the fact of the matter is, is that we all get angry, whether we're husbands and wives or children or anything in between that. The question is, though, did you know that anger is a habit? Did you know that? Anger is something that is a habit that you and I not only have seen, but we have learned, haven't we? When you think about your lives and you think about where you came from, your temper, your attitude toward things come from our past. It sometimes comes from TV. It comes from friends. It comes from parents. It comes from our culture. Now, don't turn and blame your mom today for your anger problem. I, I know that that's, it's Mother's Day. Wait till tomorrow to talk about that part. Um, <laughs> But here's the interesting thing. If, if, you, if you understand that, that there is something that is learned, the good thing is, is that it can be unlearned too. And so we don't just have to settle and live in our own skin and say, well, that's just the way that I am. Because there's some good news in all this. We don't have to have that anger in us the way that it is right now today. When you're younger, you get angry and sometimes what follows that is that you get your way. Right? I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever tried this at home, but, but some of you, if you throw a little bit of a temper, tampering, that you know in the, in the midst of that, you kind of get your way. And when you get your way, the funny thing is, is that we just keep doing it. Because if you got your way the last time and you had the little anger problem, you get it again. And before you know it, it's a habit that just keeps on going and keeps on going. And before you know it, you almost can almost say it with a great deal of honesty, I can't help myself. Because you know that because you've done it so many times, it becomes a habit. It becomes a part of, of who you are. It becomes a part of who I am. So when we start talking about this issue of anger, we say, well, yeah, but it's just the way that I am. Or I, I couldn't help myself. It just came out that way. Well, of course it does. Because it has done something inside of you and I that it generates something that we know. If I just throw a temper, I might just get what I want. Now, that might just not be just for your children. It might be for you, too. And we understand this too, though, that when it comes to the Lord, God says that that's not the way that I want you to react. And I don't want that for you. I didn't want that from you from the beginning. So it may be according to your fleshly desires that you and I say, well, I've got an anger problem, but God says, that's not, I want, that's not what I want for you. And it's most certainly not according to my word for you. There is something about you as a child of God that changes us. Doesn't mean that we're never going to be angry. 
And never does, doesn't mean we're going to blow our tops ever. We're, we're, we're going to. It's going to happen. But God says, that is not the way I designed you, and nor do you have to live in that bondage all the days of your life either. So today, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take some time this morning to talk about the, what I think is uh, some of the most devastating things about uh, the effects that anger has on us. Because it does have some effect on us. Now I'm going to talk about the effect, but then I'm going to jump quickly after that into some things that we can do to change the course of the way that we deal with our anger. So just so you're wondering, well, hey, if anger is a good thing, if I can get what I want, then why would I ever change what I'm doing? And I just want you to know that even though you may get what you want because you get angry, it does not mean that there is not devastating effects because of your anger. So this morning, I'd like for you to write these few things down because I want you to just know for yourself, if you're Mr. Angry or Mrs. Angry today, and you think, well, I, it's got me this far and I've done pretty well so far, I do want you to know that there's some effects to your anger. So if you take your notes out and you want to write these things down, it would be helpful. The first devastating effect that we see when it comes to anger is this. Anger shuts down the ability or our ability to solve problems. Did you know that? Anger has the ability to shut down our ability to solve those issues and those problems that are around us every single day. James chapter 1 verse 19 tells us this. It's very specific about this when he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, he says. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And here's the reason why. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. He says simply this, the anger of men will never achieve the righteousness of God. In other words, it's simply this, it will not allow something that is wrong to be made right. Not at least in the eyes of God, and at least not in God's ways. So you may think that you're getting something out of your anger or that your anger produces something that is good for you, but God says that you will never be able to make that which is wrong right, not according to God's righteousness. And that's what we're hoping for, his righteousness. Here's the second thing that, uh, that anger can affect us in. Anger causes you to become lonely, <laughs> Now, I just want to stop here and say this just from a personal standpoint. Maybe some of you are not made up like I am, but I want you to know that this is a tough passage. This is a tough idea for me because I hate being alone. But the idea of knowing that my anger can put me into a place where I am alone by myself, that is a tragedy. I want you to look at this with me. We're, not, we're going to jump through these effects because I want to spend some time in how we, how we make a course correction when it comes to our anger. But Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 and 25 tells us this. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Now, for some of you, you're thinking right now, well, I shouldn't even go to work tomorrow, right? I mean, that's already an issue, right? But he's saying, don't be around that. Or it will snare you. you got to watch who you hang with. Is it your girlfriend? Is it your boyfriend? Is it your friends? Is it your coworkers? The reality of it is, the Word of God tells us that if you allow yourself to be around that all the time, you will become like that. You will get ensnared into that whole idea of looking at things the way that those who are heavily angered, hot-tempered react. And I would dare to say that you already know that. I would dare to say that some of you know that when you go to work on Monday, no matter what good mood you're in, somehow your attitude can be changed just because of the culture and the people that are around you because of their attitudes. If you work in an office and you have a cubicle, you know it just takes a few words to set the rest of your day off, and it's all because of what you hear. It's all because of what's going on around you. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 29 says this. Whoever brings ruin... On their family, and in some translations talk about bring anger to your family, you will inherit only wind. Can you imagine that? This is your inheritance. For those who bring anger and temper to a home or ruin to a home, inherit only wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. What a tough scripture. Soon we will have nothing left, he says. Anger will cause us to end up with absolutely nothing. I don't know about you, but what a sad reality. 
Some of you have already experienced some of that in your own families. Broken relationships, homes that, where, where children don't speak to their parents and vice versa. It's very real, isn't it? This is not just for some of you, is it? It really is for all of us. And here's one that I think all of us struggle with, and here it is, the third. Anger blinds you to your own selfishness. Anger blinds you to your own self. You cannot see it. That's the hard part about it sometimes. Sometimes you're so consumed with your anger that you're so selfish about yourself that you can't see that you are selfish. James 4, 1 and 2 says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you, he says? Don't they come from, here it is, your desires that battle within you? That selfishness that's inside of you that you don't have what you want, but you really do want it? You desire, but you do not have. You long for what your neighbor has. You want it so bad, and it's just eating you up inside. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Now, some of you say, well, pastor, I don't kill anybody. But you kill relationships. You kill families. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel, and you fight. You do not have, he says, because you do not ask God. You can't get it. You're selfish for something and not for the right reasons. And Matthew says in, verse, in chapter 7, verse 3, Why do you look at the speck or sawdust of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? What, what a visual picture of the fact that you look at other people and you see that little something that's in their life that's not right, but you cannot get away from the plank that is in your own eye. You're so selfish and so centered on yourself that you can't see beyond that. I don't know about you, but that's convicting to me. I don't know about you, but how is that possible that we can't see those things? It is the depth and the spiral of what anger can do in a person's life. Selfishness in a person's life. Anger in itself is not always wrong, by the way, and we know that. I say that cautiously, by the way. Can I just tell you that up front? Like anything else, it can be abused, right? And I don't know about you, but I remember a few times, if, the, if, I'm, if this is confessional time this morning, I want you to know that there's times in my life that I've thrown up, but you remember what Jesus did when he went to the temple and he saw the tables and he flipped them over, remember? He was angry at that. It's okay, sometimes it's good to be angry at that kind of stuff that you see. But can I just say one quick thing about this whole issue of anger? Be very careful. Be, the Word of God says, in your anger, do not sin, right? In your anger, do not sin. You know, the one thing that I want to caution all of us about this morning, is something that was shared with us at our conference, is that we need to save room for God's anger, not our own. See, here's the difference between you and I flipping the table over and Jesus flipping the table over. I flip the table over, and I'm angry, and there's things going on, and maybe I'm justified for my anger even. But you know inside of me, maybe there's still other things that's there that I need to look at. The difference between me and Jesus and you and Jesus is that in his anger, he was righteous. In Jesus' anger, he didn't sin. I don't know about you, but you let me get angry long enough, and it will move beyond just that which is righteous to that which is... Mm, sin. <laughs> Be very careful that you don't use that illustration for your own good just to make an excuse for your temper. Anger in itself is not always wrong, absolutely. Ephesians, uh, again, please write this down. You can just be re reminded of this. Be angry, but do not sin. I would suggest to you that in your anger, save room for God's wrath. In your anger, save room for you to examine your heart and make sure that your heart is in the right place too. That's awfully important. We never go that far. So here's the question this morning, then how do we refocus that anger? If we really understand these, these ideas and these, these things that can affect us in dangerous ways, and we realize none of us want that for our families, none of us want that for our homes, none of us want that for our job and where we work, so how do we adjust that? How do we change those things? So let me give you four steps this morning that I want us to suggest to you. They're not the only four things, but they're four things that could help us. And I know the first one is going to seem so elementary to you that you're going to say, Pastor, that seems kind of a, of a waste of a point, really. I mean, maybe you're just saying that because you're a pastor. Well, I am going to say it because I'm a pastor, but I'm also going to tell you that it's the only way that we can find hope in it. 
Because I tried to do it before I was a believer in Jesus Christ, and it did not work. But after coming to Jesus, I found that I had something that I did not have before. And here it is. The first step in, into refocusing our anger in God's way is simply this. Commit your life to Jesus. See, I told you, you're going to say, wow, that was so simple. How long did it take you to come up with that one? Let me tell you that before I committed my life to Jesus and my anger, my marriage was never right. Before I committed my life to Jesus, the way I dealt with people in my workplace and in my friendships was never the way that God wanted me to. And, and if I tried so hard and I gritted my teeth and I tried to hold back, I could do it for a little bit, but I could never reach where I needed to be. It was always falling short all the time. Ephesians 2 verse 15 says this, by setting aside in his flesh, he's talking about relationships here, the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose, he says, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, he said, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Here it is. There's your answer. It is through a relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross for us, by which, he says, he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. For believers, we are, before we were believers, we were in conflict with God. I never thought about, that my, about myself like that before I came to Jesus Christ. I did not realize that I was in conflict with God. But the reality of it is, before I came to that place where I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, whether or not I admitted it or not, I was in conflict with him. I rejected his ways. I was unyielding to who he is. So the first step for you and I is to make peace with others, and to make peace with God. That's the first step. And by the way, can I just say something, and this is maybe more geared to the men today, but certainly for all of us. I believe this with all my heart. The fact is, is that most conflicts between husbands and wives, parents and children, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, I think that all of those conflicts and all those issues of anger could be resolved overnight. Yes, listen to me carefully. It could be resolved overnight if we are fully committed to Jesus. I think that that changes things. Because once we have his strength, we have the power to do what we cannot do on our own. And see, there's the problem. And as I have preached and talked about my past to you many, many times, I go back to the first year of our marriage, and no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard my wife tried, we neither one had the strength to win the victory. We neither one had the strength to find peace in our marriage because it was anger and it was, it was hurt feelings. And the reason why is because we didn't have the peace of God in our lives. It was through his strength that we found that peace. Here's the second thing that you need to know. Prioritize the eternal value of relationships. We don't put the value on relationships the way that we need to. I think that relationships are one of the most, one of the greatest treasures of our lives. All the world treasures that you could think of, all the things that you could, you could begin to fathom, the things that you love so much, it's the house, it's the car, it's the boat, it's this, it's that. Of all the things that you could ever accumulate, the money that, that all the money in the world, all those things as nice as they are, folks, if you don't have people to share it with, does it really have any value at all? The only thing that makes those things wonderful is the people that you get to share it with. Because without re relationships, what is there of true value? What is there of true value if there's no relationship with Jesus Christ? What true value is there if we don't have this kind of community where we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and grow together and have accountability with one another and encourage one another in those moments when we're struggling in life? It's relationships. Matthew 5, verse 22 tells us this, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with, his, with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment, he says. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, 
is, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool, by the way, I remember as a young child, anytime I ever used the word fool, I remember my grandmother would just slap me across the face, and here's the reason why. Because you will be in danger of fire of hell. And that's what my grandma literally thought. You say fool and you're going to hell. I didn't say fool very long, but it was a big deal. And then he goes on, he says this. This is the important part. Therefore, he says, this is how big relationships are. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Here's the question. What if someone doesn't like me, though? What if, what if I try and they don't do anything uh, to help? Or what, what, if, what if I can't get through to them? Here's what you need to know. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 is a reminder to you and to me. It's simply this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. As far as it depends on you, you do everything that you can, and you have to leave the rest of it to him. Live at peace, he says, with everyone. Even if they slam the door on you, or they keep your door, uh, you always have to keep your door open for them. Can I tell you something, and I wasn't planning on talking about this, so I'm going to make this short and sweet. For over 10 years, I had no relationship with my father. And my mother. Thursday morning, I had a conversation. And there was reconciliation. And for 10 years of not seeing my mother and my father, Today, I get to spend Mother's Day with my mother. Prayer, the reminder of what God can do when we trust in him. Relationships are more important than you and I coming to church. That's what God's word says. God is saying prioritize the eternal value of your relationships. And here's what you need to know. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Now, wait a minute. I can be in church all the way up until it's time for the offering, and I can scoot out because I've got issues with other people, and I need to go take care of those things. Yes, you should. But we also remember it says to lay your offering down at the altar before you leave. Okay? So when you plan to do that, you bring your offering down here, and then you go take care of your issue with your brother or your sister. I don't know if I stretched biblically the theology around that, but it sounded pretty good in the moment when I was thinking about it. <laughs> okay, back to where we were. Let me give you f four quick things, and this is just a sidebar for this whole issue of understanding the, the power behind eternal relationships, that last point that I just made. Here are four things, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, and I, I wish I had the time to just go through Scripture and, and just feed off of all these four things, but I want to give four quick things to you before we finish our other two points this morning, and here are some things to remember about how to help when relationships are struggling. Here's the first. Remember who the enemy is. See, oftentimes what we want to do is we want to place the, 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 the blame on an individual and who they are, and the reality of it is it is never about them. It is understanding who the true enemy is, and the enemy who comes to kill and to steal and destroy is not, his name is not James, it's not John, it is Satan. He is the core of where all that comes from, not the person. It's someone that you and I can't see, and he does it very well. Here's the second. Be very slow to speak. Avoid arguing at all possible. And here's what I mean by that. If you're in a struggling relationship, sometimes the best thing to do is for a period of time. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be arguments. It doesn't mean there's going to be times of strong disagreement. But to build a foundation for your relationship early so that when those times come and you have those heated arguments, you can win, not destroy each other. Because sometimes we just assume that we can just fight and it's going to be fine. But if that relationship has not been secured, if that relationship has not been built upon a foundation that is true, you will destroy each other every single time. Be very slow to speak. Take some time to grow together first. The third is this. Switch your focus. 
from your interest to their interest. The Word of God tells us that we're to put other people's interests before our own. And so often we never do that. We don't think about other people. We don't think about the struggle that they're going through. And here's something that's really interesting that we've been going through as a leadership team. We're going through a book right now, and one of the focal points of that book is is the art of noticing. It's the art of noticing people. You and I walk into a store. We walk into an office. We walk into our homes, and we don't take time to notice people. We kind of walk right by. Sometimes we need to look at our spouse, look at our children, look at our grandparents, look at our coworkers, and notice them for a little while to determine, God, what is it that they need right now? To put their interest before our own. Here's the last one real quick. I told you we're going to not spend much time on it. Here it is. Choose to bless and not to curse. Don't return evil for evil. Here's what I, I want to be very careful how I say this this morning because this is convicting to me too. It is not enough just to forgive. I know that sometimes we think, well, I just need to forgive, and I've done that part, and I'm just moving on. Okay, do you know what's interesting about that little scenario? Is that you can forgive, and yet you truly have forgiven, right? But if you become a person who doesn't care about that person, you become a person who who their interests don't bother you at all, so if they get sick or financially they're in trouble, it doesn't bother you any. You're indifferent with them. Who cares? I can forgive them, but I don't have to think about them. God says for you and I, we're to choose to bless them rather than curse them. So let me ask you, how many times have you woken up and you've thought about that individual that you've been struggling with in a relationship and you've asked God to bless them? When have you done that? When have you taken that opportunity? Not to just think about all that they've done to you that was wrong, but how, how many times have you ever said, Lord, today bless that person? Can I tell you what it'll do? It'll change your heart. It'll change your heart. It'll change the way that you think about them. Here's the third thing. Back to our our points again. The third thing that we need to understand that we need to do too is this. Be willing to experience suffering for the sake of growth. This one we could spend a whole lot of time on, but when I got, when it comes to my relationship and I think about where I was early on in our marriage and I think about our our relationship early on, I, I think about how I was not willing to suffer for my wife. When I think about the things that we do in our our journey together, what I don't like is when I feel like that I'm the one who's getting the bad rap. And I want other people to know I'm right and they're wrong and they're going to suffer and therefore it's okay. And I just want to say something about that. God gives us a call, and it's not just a call to men, but I'm going to speak specifically to each of us as men. God says that we're to love our wives and, and how, how, how overwhelming this is. We're to love our wives as God loved the church, as Christ loved the church. So much so that what did he do? That he laid down his life for her. He suffered for us, the bride, and he didn't deserve it. He didn't do anything to, to, to deserve to suffer. But that's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. And God's word tells you and I, if you want to understand what it means to love and to move beyond the anger that you have, suffer for one another. Sometimes it's at the core of who we are, isn't it, that, that we, we don't want to say it out loud. I remember it was a few years back, a couple years back, my wife and I decided, by the way, here's a little rule of thumb. If you ever move into a house or you're in a house and you decide to take wallpaper down, leave it. Don't touch it. My wife and I decided that we're going to take a border, just a border. We're not even talking about the whole wallpaper. We're just talking about a border. We're going to take the border down. And, of course, my wife said, do you think we can do it? I said, we can do it. We can, I can tear that paper right off of there. So I'm up there and I'm starting to put the little divots in it and I'm putting the wash in it, you know, and getting it all soft. And then, then I got this, I went to Four Star Rental. There's a little plug for you. I got, went to Four Star Rental and I got this heater thing that you can put on it to really loosen it up really good. And I took off the first layer and I realized there's another layer under it. <laughs> and then we realized there was another layer under it. Three layers. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, who puts three layers on? Why don't you just take the other layer off? And I was kind of angry. And I'm, the more I looked at my wife, the more I felt like, this is your fault. You wanted the, <laughs> you wanted the wallpaper off. 
But you know what? I had a choice. I could be angry at her for wanting to do it, or I could suffer for her. And let me tell you, the good outcome is you suffer for her. We need to suffer for one another too, don't we? Because when we suffer for one another, we show each other that we truly do love. And it moves us beyond the anger to a place of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7 talks about taking each other to court. It's a common verse that you've probably heard many times, but, but you don't read always the last part of it. And he says this, the very fact, and this is verse 7 of chapter 6, the very fact that you have a lawsuit among you means you have been completely defeated already. Wow, what kind of statement is that? Between brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. He goes on, he says this, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? <laughs> I'm thinking, wait a minute, well, I don't deserve to be cheated. Why should I be wronged? Let those who suffer trust their souls to Jesus Christ. Jesus took the pain for us, for our wrongdoings. He took the pain for us. That's important. So when that happens and redemption takes place, here's the last thing that you need to remember. When things aren't going well, ask for advice. Shouldn't it be the same way in, in, in our marriages? You know, I think about this all the time. What I'm grateful for in my life is that I've had men, I've had people I could go to who I could ask for advice other than looking for those people who are, lightning, who are not a lightning rod for me. You know, I didn't know this, and this is going to show my ignorance. I always wondered on the top of buildings, what were these things on the top that just stuck off at the top? They looked like antennas, but I couldn't understand what they were. And somebody told me, well, it's kind of to help to protect the building so it doesn't catch fire. It kind of, it kind of withholds that from spreading. And I thought, that's really interesting. That's the kind of people we need to surround ourselves with as well. Because I can get myself around people that they're either a lightning rod or they're a conductor. I get around a conductor and I start feeding off on what I feel. My anger starts coming up. And what do they do? They just make me more angry. They justify it. You, you should feel that way. You shouldn't let them do that to you. Before you know it, I was angry before, but I'm more angry now. What we need are people in our lives who are lightning rods, who when we, when we speak that anger, when we go to them for advice, that we also can find ourselves finding that person who calms us, who holds us back from getting worse than what we are, to, to feed and ground that anger that's in our lives. Let me tell you, folks, if you've never had a friend, if you've never had a, a person like that in your life, you need one. When David did what he did with Bathsheba, a great friend of his named Nathan came to him and said, David, I need to tell you what happened. I need to tell you a story. It was because of Nathan that David's heart was changed. It was because of Nathan who helped David to see where he was wrong that David confessed. We need those type of people in our lives. We don't need people who are just make a, become a conductor to us. We need people to help us to, to eliminate that stuff in our lives. Those are just four things. And I'm sorry that I feel like I've rushed this morning, but I just want to tell you today that God is more than capable. God is more than capable of helping you with your anger. And whether or not your anger is outwardly expressed or inwardly held, it's anger, isn't it? For some of us, we hold it in until it boils, and then it, bleh. and for some of you, it just comes out naturally, openly, quickly. Neither one of those is better than the other. How you deal with your anger shows the development of the value of relationships with people and with your relationship with Jesus Christ. So you can go on, and you can live out your life in the anger that you have now, and you may just get what you think that you wanted, but it will not bring you peace. It will not help you to see that, there, that you are selfish. You will continue to be that way. You will end your life with nothing. That's a promise from God's word. Those are the realities of who we are. That's the reality of what anger does to a family. And I just want to say to you this morning, it ought not to be that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. Unless you do it on your own, which will get you nowhere, Find your strength in Jesus Christ who helps us all the way through. So I'd like to ask this morning if you would stand. We're going to sing together this morning. Mothers, as you leave today, please make sure that you note on the way out today, we have a special gift for you, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that. 
we want to thank you in a special way for being who you are. But right now, in this moment, the best thing that we could do is to deal with the anger. And if you want to do it here at the altar, you can. You can do it right where you are, right where you're at tonight, today. You can ask him, and he will do a work in your life. He'll, be, he'll give you the peace that starts to give you strength for this journey. Let me pray for you, then we'll sing together. And at the end of the song, you're dismissed, okay? Father, this morning, Lord, we're so very thankful for who you are. It is in the anger, it is in those struggles that we find ourselves very lonely. And what it produces is absolutely nothing, not of eternal significance. So, Father, I pray for each, each and every one of us who are here today that, Lord, in some way that you would speak and that we would listen and that we would follow and that we would be obedient to you. Father, may the words that come from our lips be that which encourages and not destroys. Father, I ask that your spirit now speak to us and if there be anyone here, Lord, who needs to make adjustments, who needs to make a change, Lord, convict their hearts today. Let them know, Lord, that there can be a difference in their life with Jesus Christ. Father, we ask it in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen.